Today we have with us an entrepreneur, a renowned speaker, a business leader, enthusiastic podcast host, and above all, a tech-loving finance leader. We have James Solomons, the global CFO and co-CEO of XREF, the, the leading online referencing solution. And I'm going to go a little deeper into what XREF is all about. But even before that, uh, James comes with over 20 years of experience in accounting and corporate finance. He's held uh, several positions in that sector. Uh, he was with Zero Australia as the head of accounting, the co-founder of Aptus Accounting Advisory, which was named the most innovative accounting firm in Australia at the 2018 Australian Accounting Awards. And he's also spent his share of time in public practice. Um, James identifies himself as an educator. He's written exclusively on the next generation of accounting, uh, is a guest lecturer, um, uh, Host the CFO Lunchtime series and has created a thriving community for knowledge sharing. So the intersection of technology, business, accounting, that's that's where James plays. And that's a very interesting area because, you know, like they're, they're, they're almost like three completely different universes. So welcome to the podcast, James. I'm very interested and intrigued on some of the things that we're going to open out today. Thanks, Vikram. Uh, I am very happy to be here. And you're right. Um, I do sit across a few different of the uh, two of the different universes of the accounting industry, which, uh, which yeah, I, I do actually quite enjoy being across all different facets. But I'm sure we'll dive into that as we as we go through the questions today. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, for starters, um, I want to I want to go a little deeper into XREF. Because I know uh, you've mentioned XREF uh, began as a rough sketch on a napkin in a restaurant somewhere. But can you talk to us a little bit more about what exactly is XREF? How did it come about? What, what's, what's the whole backstory and where are you today? Yeah, absolutely. So XREF was founded um, over a long lunch between the two co-founders, um, Lee Martin Seymour and Tim Griffiths. I, I'm not a co-founder, so uh, I joined uh, six years into the journey. But effectively, um, yeah, it started uh, after a a fraud case, a referencing fraud case, at a client of Lee's. Uh, of a client of Lee's, he was he's a recruitment uh, professional, and um, basically they they sat down and they they talked between themselves for lunch, and they just turned into afternoon tea, and then to dinner, and a couple of bowls of wine about how you know technology. Um, could start to change the way references are done. So XREF at its core is an employment referencing product. So it's automated the way that people take references, you know, when somebody goes for a job. So if you're going for a job, you might be asked to give three references. And in the traditional fashion, you would give a, the name and contact number of, of three different people. The recruitment agency or the internal recruiter would call that particular person and speak to them over the phone and ask questions about you. And you would, uh, that person would then give back to the recruiter um, information that's never existed before. Uh, it would be recorded in a haphazard fashion and stuck in a file somewhere, never to be seen again. What we've done is automate that process um, and start to firstly uh, protect businesses against breaches of uh, discrimination, uh, privacy laws, because there's certain things you can't ask about somebody um, when you're getting a reference. And certainly also protect against fraud. Now, when I say fraud, you would be amazed at the amount of times we see on any given day, the amount of people that try to fake their references to get a job. Um, and so what we've done is automate that entire process and we put the, the candidate at the centre of the opportunity or, or the reference. And it's their responsibility to find the referees and they keep, you know, it's a, it's a nice experience and they keep abreast of whether the referee is given feedback. But in the same time, We've got a platform, as you would guess, being a SaaS product, that in the background is is watching lots of things going on. It, it looks for incidences of, of potential reference fraud. So, yeah, opening, trying to give you know, use you know, use a uh, a non corporate domain for a referee, or you send an email and then it gets picked up or opened in the same Wi Fi or on the same device. So it's flagging things. So what it does is it's effectively completely automated. Um, the referencing process, but at the same time, it's also removed the need to take phone-based references, which is where the uh, where the particular uh, XREF journey started. Because a um, uh, somebody was going for a job, the recruiter wanted to get that person into the job, 
uh, that person was not referenceable, and so they faked the references. <laughs> and effectively, by faking the references, and three months later, that person got fired for for something in the business when it was found out that uh, the references weren't even taken. Uh, effectively, the business was very upset, and of course, Lee Lee then as an entrepreneur himself, thought about how he could go about it. Tim Griffiths was the technology buff, and between the two of them, they founded the business in 2010. And it was originally built for for SMEs, for small businesses, micro businesses that couldn't afford to maybe have a a a large recruitment team. But funnily enough, the very first client was Fuji Xerox, and the second client was Westpac, one of Australia's big four banks. And so the two guys saw very early on that the product that they built for a particular segment of, of industry could actually be an enterprise product. Um, and with that, they, they began their journey. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a typical bootstrap story where they started off together um, working their full-time jobs. XREF was running in the background, um, you know, built, the, built the original products from the ground up. And then it wasn't until 2013 that they employed their, their first employee, David Haynes, who's actually still in the business today. Uh, and then in 2015, took the first little bit of money um, to fund the product. Um, and then in 2016, went public, uh, which is then when, when I started. And since then, we've gone from obviously a, a small, profitable Australian private company to a uh, you know, large People, some people say large is a certain size, but we're in, in the Australian context, we're a large, profitable global company now in the space of five years since going public. So that's a little bit about, I guess, the XREF journey. Um, uh, and yeah, there's some other questions I'm sure we're going to get into about, you know, all those tipping points of, of when we've decided to do things. Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, I want to I wanna now dive from the company to you as an individual because, you know, You've had an interesting career yourself. Like we were just talking about how you've played at the intersection of technology and finance. So how do, how do you see your career journey looking back? Really, really interesting. Um, you know, I before I started in accounting, so I finished school, took a year off, and then started at Macquarie University doing a business degree. Uh, did that for, for 12 months full-time. And then uh, applied for a job at a local accounting practice. Um, got the job on the spot, uh, which was pretty cool, and decided to to obviously follow that that uh, career path of becoming a, an accountant. So I worked in this small firm quickly, quickly moving forward while completing my studies. Um, and then once I finished at uni in a part time capacity, was already sort of moving quite ahead. It was only a small practice. I didn't have to move too far, but I'm moving ahead. Um, and then completed my chartered accounting um, uh, qualification. So became a, a CA in in late 2017. Uh, sorry, 2007. Um, and then um, shortly after that, became a partner at the age of 28, having bought a an accounting practice to bring into the partnership, which was back then the way that you became a partner in a smaller firm, you generally bought out an existing partner or you bought a parcel of fees uh, and brought that into your entry to partnership. But at 27 years old, that was pretty young back then um, to in, in the mid-2000s to, um, to become a partner. And so, you know, that sort of continued until, you know, 2014 when things started to, to, be, to become a bit more interesting. But in that time, you know, it was very much about, um, you know, adding value to clients and using technology to to sort of add that value uh, to clients. Um, 2014, though, uh, became very interesting. You know, back in 2011, I'd started coming across a product called Xero. Um, back then in Australia, it was very, 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 very new, even very, very new to, to the world. It was founded in 2006 and, and effectively started to get a few clients onto it. By about 2013, I was pretty well entrenched with the the Zero community, um, spending a lot of time with the Zero team in Melbourne, just helping them with, you know, what small businesses were looking for, and also what accounting practices were looking for out of cloud technology. And then in 2014, I got a, a tap on the shoulder um, from the managing director of uh, 
Zero was straight out of the time, Chris Ridd, just asking if um, I'd seen a job ad that they had created. Funnily enough, this job ad had been created after I wrote a blog in May of 2014 challenging Zero to educate the industry that they had uh, very abruptly disrupted for good. But there are a lot of scared accountants out there about what this this cloud meant for the way that they would conduct their their work. Um, so they'd written, they'd read this blog, it had done the rounds internally, then they created this role called the head of accounting. And they asked me if I'd be interested in, in applying. Um, so I did. Uh, and then I was I was offered the position. And that sort of set in motion a real change in in my career. So up until 2014, it was public practice. Uh, that was going to be my retirement you know, become a partner and grow it and then sell it one day. Obviously using technology to be the underpinning of it. And then, um, yeah, I got this role for zero. But my big uh, request was that I was allowed to run my practice still, uh, which I'd become, as I say, a partner of, um, but also work for zero. Because for me, uh, it's all about being authentic when you're in a position like that. And the minute you're not in the day-to-day, you're not in the trenches, you're not running a firm, it's very hard to stand up on stage and tell people how to run their practice uh, or tell them the best ways to run their practice. So they agreed, um, which was interesting given, you know, running a practice is a full-time job. And even though Zero was a a part-time job uh, on paper, you know, given the task ahead, uh, it was always going to be a full-time position, uh, much to the much to the joy of my wife, <laughs> with a young family and in, in jumping into into this role, and effectively, um, get the later on in 2014. That was in August, and then by December, I'd actually decided to leave the firm I'd been with for 15 odd years and start a new practice uh, with a new co-founder and have it completely underpinned by technology, all cloud-based clients, um, all focused on on delivering uh, advice. And yeah, you know, as you said in your opening comments, you know, um, 2018, you know, we were awarded the most innovative accounting practice in Australia at the Australian Accounting Awards, uh, which was which was a testament to what we'd set out to achieve. But somewhere in the middle there, I'd um, I'd I'd been introduced to Tim and Lee, um, who were looking just after going public um, to uh, to find a CFO. They also needed a new external accounting practice, and given the network and the cloud um, and the connections I've built there, that they were referred to me and, and Rebecca, my business partner at Aptus. And um, I went in and I met them and really enjoyed the, the the journey that they'd been on. It was very similar at zero and it was it was it was about efficiency and using technology. Very, very similar name, <laughs> Zero and XREF. Um, and I became the caretaker CFO in, in the month of March. 2016, while they went overseas to open up some overseas offices. They came back um, a couple of weeks later. I helped them try and find a CFO and we couldn't find one that they liked. So they looked at me and said, we actually like you. Uh, Would you like to be our CFO on a part-time basis? I was like, okay, well, I'm running a practice. I'm the head of accounting for zero. Sure, I'll just add that into my daily routine and I'll I'll pick up the the CFO gig of of an ASX-listed company. Um, in hindsight, I mean, that was probably for my career the best decision uh, or one of the best decisions I made as well as joining Zero. in that working in an ASX listed company is is a is a job like no other in the sense of the not only the um, the compliance regime, but certainly um, you know the access to capital that you have and but also the requirements to to toe the line with 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 the, the capital markets. So, so th- that was from 2016. By about 2017, uh, I was pretty much full time in that role. I had pulled back on the practice side, but was still working for Zero. And then in June 2018, finished at Zero, and and obviously XREF uh, became the the main gig. I am a still very small owner of the accounting practice that I that I founded, uh, but it's gone on to do bigger and better things without me <laughs> around, which is good. Um, but yeah, I mean that's sort of been my my career journey in a in a couple of minutes um, in terms of my um, my professional my professional and paid paid world is probably the best way to put it. That's that's quite a trajectory, right? But I just feel like there's one little part that uh, I think maybe uh, we skipped through, right? In that you've evo- like you've you've jumped from 
playing accountant to playing CFO, especially playing CFO at a startup where so many things are changing. And I know outside in, it looked like, oh yeah, an accountant, uh, an accountant with a, with a more expensive suit as a CFO. But that's not completely true, right? As a CFO, you need to worry about so many other things. There's metrics, the strategy, like what changed? And like, how do you, how do you see this, this evolution uh, from accountant to CFO? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, when, as I said, you know, the start of my, my I guess my professional you know, career was, was a business degree starting in a, a BBA at Macquarie. And I'd always had an interest in, in business. Funnily enough, accounting, I didn't enjoy accounting at high school. Um, but when I, I was fortunate, the firm that I started with and was with for 14 years was very much about business advice. So I spent 14, 15 years advising small businesses on how to grow their business, you know, spending, you know, everything from, you know, um, traditional accounting based things like, you know, you know, cost of products and cost of goods sold and improving margins right through to, to, to some clients, helping them with, with marketing strategies. And, and certainly when the cloud came along, um, it was all about the technology and how they built their businesses on, on efficient processes. So I, I'm a bit of a process geek. I like to improve processes map out things and, and, and find a better way to do things. So I, I actually spent a lot of time with clients doing that. So in, in the sense of even though, you know, tax uh, is, my, is my bread and butter in terms of, you know, you know I've been an accountant for 21 odd years now. It's the thing I've done the most out of those 21 years. But certainly it was always second fiddle to me. I always liked to, you know, for me, that was a byproduct of my engagement with my clients. And so when when the extra opportunity, and, and, and in that time, I'd started a couple of businesses. Um, I was very early on the e-commerce. You know, I had a, a baby shoe business that I started in 2010, shoe baby, with my wife. Uh, after finding it was hard to find baby shoes, we were just too early to the e-commerce world. Um, you know, we, had we started eight years later, we'd be in the boom. So I've always been early on a lot of things, but certainly I'd started a few businesses, failed a few businesses. So I, I knew what it took to, to run a business. So when the CFO gig came along, it, it effectively gave me that opportunity to take um, all of those, um, you know, well, well, sorry, let me rephrase it. it. It allowed me to put my money where my mouth was. You know, so, you know, it's essentially um, here I was now a, a CFO in a startup and taking all the things that I've been telling clients over 15 odd years um, and now having to put them into practice myself. And very quickly, I learned a lot of things were very different when it came to, um, you know, having to do that. Like firstly, and probably most importantly, when, you, when you're paid as an external accountant to come in and fix something, you have the attention of the person that pays you the money, the business owner, uh, and certainly the, um, the business because they probably said, hey, we've got this external consultant coming in you need to do what he says because he's costing us a lot of money. Not that I charged a lot in the practice. But when you go internally in a startup, everybody's got different priorities. So finance, finance is in the corner. Finance just gives the money to the marketing team and the developers and the sales team who want to go take people out for lunch and pay big money to be on at different events. Finance is the least priority of everybody in the business. So very quickly, you know, I had to learn how to influence uh, people that just, you know, in a nice way, didn't really care what I had to say because their job was to drive leads, was to bring in new clients, was to develop new product. Whereas here I was saying, don't spend too much. We've only got this much money. And they're like, yeah, but I've got to do this and I've got to do that. So um, so you're right, it is it is a big, big change. Um, but, you know, I've always been good at adapting to, to, to different changes, different you know, scenarios, no different to the zero gig uh, that I had. Here I was, as, again, a small business accountant, now on the sort of national stage as the industry lead, um, helping to transform an industry. I, I will say there was a fair bit of imposter syndrome <laughs> every now and then uh, in those, you know, in those early, early couple of uh, uh, trips around the country on different roadshows. But very quickly, I, I learned that um, if I'm authentic and, and, and lead, with, um, uh, lead with facts, people find it very hard to argue with you. And so certainly in the accounting space in, in CFO world, uh, particularly in startup, you lead with the numbers. People, people too tend to eventually 
start to listen. But you have to put it in their language. So I have a term called humanize the numbers, um, which, you know, I, I coined a couple of years ago, which has now been used by a few other people, but that's okay. But effectively, our job as CFOs is to humanize the numbers into the language of the marketing teams and the sales teams. And that, and that for me, has been how I've been able to trans- make that successful transition um, to, to CFO from a traditional uh, tax account, if you like, which is not often the way it's done. Often it's the other way around. You get people coming from industry uh, moving into practice as consultants, using their experience in industry. Very rarely do you find it goes goes the other way. Now, this is this is kind of interesting uh, when 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 you talk about all of this uh, being resilient, being adaptive, because you've also spoken about the importance of being a cyber resilient CFO before, right? Um, and as as another big responsibility for the modern CFO. Can you tell me a little bit more about what does it mean to be a cyber resilient CFO and what's, what's, what's the significance of the word resilient here? Yeah, cyber resilience. I mean, cyber's everywhere now. And I think, you know, let's say 10 years ago uh, when businesses weren't all operating with technology underpinning everything they did or, or they, when they weren't exposed to the cloud, you know, cyber security or, or IT security was often about, you know, managing laptops and passwords and things like that. Whereas these days, you know, um, m- most businesses are running with some form of cloud technology somewhere. Uh, even if they're a traditional manufacturing bricks and mortar type store, they've still got probably financial data stored in the cloud. And, and certainly in small businesses, you know, um, there's not a lot of resources. But in saying that then, you know, the, they probably might not have as much uh, at risk. Whereas if you go to a business like ours or any large business that's in, in SaaS world, uh, we store you know, information on individuals. We have a lot of financial information, obviously. We're an ASX listed company, so everybody wants to know what's going on in our world um, you know, to, to try and make investment decisions. So ultimately, the CFO sort of has two roles to play here. Um, one, I see the CFO, the modern CFO, as, the, as a data custodian. Uh, and so we, we had the privilege of seeing most parts of data. You know, you have different teams. You have marketers see the marketing information, sales see the sales information, developers see a lot of the, the, the information regarding, you know, the, the platform. We see the financial information, but we also get all that other information coming to us to allow us to mix it all together. So we get that privileged position of probably being the only department that sees all the information. And... Um, you know, for that reason, we have to protect it. So certainly we have to be, you know, pretty pretty strong on the importance of data protection. On the flip side, we also are the ones that have to invest in that. So as a, as a CFO, much like any, um, and I joke about this all the time, you know, most CFOs, most accountants are, are sort of cost, cost adverse. We don't like to spend too much money. As much as I like to think I like to spend money, um, I can't spend it as fast as my marketing team can. So I always say, as an accountant, if you want to learn how to spend money, go and spend a, go and spend a week with your marketing team. They'll, they'll show you how to spend money really quick uh, or even with your sales team. Um, spend, spend time with them. So we're, we're cost conscious, but the best way to learn about how, how a different division works is to understand how it works, understand the, well, how a marketing team works, you know, not, not be an expert. But to know what you're giving money to, it's good to understand. Cybersecurity is no different. So CFOs have to understand that the constant risks that are that are, are facing a business uh, and in your particular industry, what what part of uh, where are you exposed? And if you understand that, then you know how much to invest. Because as a CFO, the last thing you want to have happen in your business is for a cyber breach to happen or some form of um, incident to happen. And have the CTO or the head of head of data or the head of engineering point to you and go, you wouldn't give us the money for that upgrade. You wouldn't give us the money for that. Because then even though maybe it's not directly your fault, um, you haven't given the funds required. But on the on the other side, um, you don't want to spend too much. I mean, the, there's a lot of businesses that can put a lot of thing, you know, put a lot of things in place that are overkill. Can often create roadblocks for their teams and slow down things, you know, that really aren't required. So, 
our job is to to obviously protect the data, but also to invest in the technology that protects it. But on the other, on again on the other side, so we've got three sides. It's interesting, but if we go a bit further, um, the head of uh, data and privacy in our business reports to me, or to our general counsel who reports to me, and her job's to go around and find all the holes, you know. And there's not a lot, but she she will go around here. We need to strengthen this. We need to strengthen that. And I spend a lot of time with her now, understanding you know where we're at risk, where where we could improve things, um, and that's great knowledge that I didn't have before. So the best thing to do is understand you're never going to know all of it. Um, but you need to employ the, the people that do know. Secondly, you need to take the time to understand where your potential points of exposure are, your weaknesses. And thirdly, um, be a champion for it internally and, and provide the funds required and then make it business as usual. So, you know, very much now um, you know, cyber and, and protection of data, it's not, a, it's not a thing that sits on the outside of, of everything that's happening it's up to everybody in the business. So as a CFO, you know, no different to people, um, you know, me professing to people to be cost conscious and to, to watch every dollar and, and make sure they treat every dollar as their own, right? It's, 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 it's treat the data as though it's your own. Treat it as though it's your own information that could be exposed to the, to, to the outside world. Um, you know, um, make sure there's lots of training going on. Uh, make sure people are aware of, of things that could be, could be happening and um yeah it's 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 just another it's as you say it's just another hat for us to wear but certainly um you know the fact that it has to be part of businesses day-to-day operations now again it's, it just falls into into one of those things that you know we 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 manage but also provide the funding for so therefore it's it, it sits squarely where we sit and particularly if you don't have a large business that's got a for instance, a chief security officer or a chief information officer, um, you know, and if you're not a technology business, you probably don't have those. Hence, why it often lands in the CFO's uh, back pocket to to manage. And uh, you've you've literally had an opportunity to put this to test in the last what I keep saying two years, but it's actually been more than two years now. It's it's been three years of crazy. It's going to be, and uh, you know. 2020 was weird. Um, a lot of organizations, especially at, at uh, XREF, right, uh, where you had a lot of organizations um, uh, enforcing um, clampdowns on their hiring, and then there was a hiring boom, and then now there's this uh, this, this worldwide great resignation phenomenon where you know you have a lot of candidates, a lot of people that like moving jobs frustrated with uh, the status quo, all of that stuff. And so there's particularly in the market that you're at in, in, in XREF, you've seen a bunch of these waves where uh, I don't know if you, you know, before you had a chance to think about how conservative you had to be, there was a, oh, should we be spending more? And before you knew that, there was like, all right, so how 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 have, how have the, these last few uh, years been for you? It's another good question. Um, obviously, you know uh, our our products, our products prior to the pandemic um, were pre-employment. So we sat at the very pointy end of the hiring phase uh, of a business. So when you when you're taking a reference on somebody, um, you're showing an intent, an intent to hire. Um, pandemic comes along. Uh, no, you know, no different to any business. We we put a freeze on hiring, as did pretty much most businesses around the world. Across all sectors, essential, non-essential, um, you know, government, um, everyone just stopped hiring. So, of course, um, given our platform is based on hiring, um, we saw our, our platform usage firstly just stop, uh, which is a bit scary. No one ever expects to see things stop, although I do always feel for CFOs of airline businesses <laughs> because no one could have ever predicted uh, entire fleets being uh, being grounded. But um we saw it stop. Uh, we saw it then pick up, um, you know, back to about fifty <clears throat> percent. So, so early twenty twenty, um, you know, we went from sort of a a, a two hundred thousand uh, dollar a week usage of our platform in terms of dollar value down to a hundred. So it had halved. Um, now, obviously, at that point, uh, we as a business were um, we weren't profitable. Uh, we had told our investors and 
and clients where we're going to become profitable. Um, but nobody expected um, what came out of, of 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 the pandemic, and so we had to we had to rethink. So you know we were a very sales led organisation at the time, um, which means we had a lot of people pounding the pavement, um, selling to clients. Every client required a sales cycle with a with a person, even at renewal time. Um, and we went, okay, well, where can we where can we change? How can we become leaner? Um, and you know we had to make some tough decisions, like many businesses did. Uh, we had to make some tough decisions and downsized our our teams. Um, and what that did is it gave us a bit of breathing space. Um, I went into the the mode of a, of a CFO of, of any business in a pandemic and spent the better part of March two thousand and twenty. Uh, just just forecasting and planning and, and trying to find out our sweet spot of of cash. So we did that and, and we survived. You know, we came out um, and we went and we saw, we basically put every client into one or two buckets. They're either essential service and non-essential. Non-essential services like hospitality, travel. I mean, Qantas, Australia's flagship carrier uh, uh, airline, was a client and still remains a client, but they basically rang us and said, look, we can't renew um, you know, we were on a bit of a hiring freeze. The next day they let 3,000 people go. Um, so you're seeing clients like that that we would see top up every year in a large dollar value just having to to stop. So, But at the same time, you know, we look after a lot of government. And, of course, in a pandemic it's the job of governments, uh, that, you know, trusted organisations to protect their citizens. So we saw government uh, recruitment um, just go through the roof, you know, three or four times um, what they would normally do uh, in any given period. So as the pandemic rolled on, uh, we started to sell a lot. We, we, we just said to our sales team, just focus on essential services, government, education, healthcare, trust, trusted economies is, is, is the word that we use. And it started to pick up. Um, and then, you know, uh, that was sort of you know, June 2020, um, we plateaued. So 2019, June 19 to June 2020, we, we stayed the same. And then and I sort of won't say I predicted that, but I basically said I just expected for 12 months we'd see no growth, um, but we would also um, we would see a, uh, a plateau of everything. Um, and we kept it. We kept everything sort of pretty even. You could almost take out the year 2020 out of our um, figures. Uh, because what happened is we started to see a downturn a bit earlier than than March when everybody went home. We started to see platform usage dropping off from about December. People were starting to get a little bit worried about this this pandemic that was coming that we didn't really know much about. So it did at quarter four, which is you know um, it's you know we're moving into quarter four now in Australia and and effectively um, it's our biggest selling season. So the pandemic hit us at our biggest selling part of the year we, we sort of saw that one year you could literally take that year out of our of our life cycle and it would just it just goes up and it goes flat and it goes back up again but of course once some um, once people got used to living with 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 the virus um people started going back to work and we started to see um you know the, the non-essential industry start to to start picking up so much so that in june 2021 we were profitable not because we'd let go of people. Um, if we, you know, letting go of people allowed us to just keep our head above water and, and remain solvent. Um, what we started to see was our change to marketing uh, led strategies was was paying dividends in the sense of it was allowing us to acquire customers, even new customers. We still were acquiring new customers at a, at a much lower cost of acquisition. We started to see this happen, and 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 we went profitable in. in for our our maiden profitability, and not just in in sort of statutory terms, but cash flow profitability, which was the which was the big thing for a company that had burnt millions um, per month um, and per quarter to within twelve months go from a, a ten million dollar loss to a um, a one hundred thousand dollar profit um, was remarkable, um, which you know certainly put us on the right um, step to go forward into this financial year. The thing that we started to see was the great resignation. Uh, we started to see um, people moving jobs and our platform was, was telling us this. We, we started to see 
um, clients that would traditionally not have that much hiring uh, do lots more hiring than they ever had. And, and whilst we at the time didn't have a way to connect it, we could certainly see in industries and we have, you know, we have clients, you know, multiple clients from the same industry, we would see extra hiring and we, we could all we could think of is people are leaving jobs and going to, to other clients or other, you know, going to competitors or other businesses in the same industry. So we started to see this great resignation and we started reading about it um, and we're like, okay, well, that's, that's what's happening because in the HR world, 15% of any business turns over in a, in a calendar year or a financial year. In terms of staff, uh, we're seeing twenty-five to thirty percent the turnover in businesses, and XREF uh, has has been no different. So yeah, we started to see it. We didn't predict it, but certainly we because we um, because we uh, had had moved from that sales led model to to the digital model, we definitely started to see you know the synergies happening there because we we decoupled our costs from our our growth rate in sales so much so that we. As I said, in the 21 financial year, we 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 grew by 31 percent in terms of sales, uh, and then uh, in this in this year to date, you know, we we're, we're up um, at similar numbers year on year, uh, up 67 percent at the end of the March quarter. So certainly, um, we've benefited from what's been happening, but it, we didn't sit in our heels. We didn't sit there and go, okay, well, let's just uh, let's just see what's gonna let's let's ride the wave. We started to build new products. So our dev team have been busy for the last two years building new products, um, you know, to 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 stretch out our addressable market, but at the same time allow us to be at all ends of the, all points of the employee life cycle. So we've gone from being at just the pre-employment stage to right through to when a, a person leaves. So we built the exit survey platform, as well as the pulse survey platform, uh, which we're bringing to market at the moment. Um, which is allowing us to to basically watch an employee move through a business and then potentially start at another business and watch their life cycle through there. So it's really interesting um, the data we're starting to collect on on employee movements uh, and and, in, and and how um, you know human capital is is in this new you know. I'd like to say post-pandemic, but I think we're still in it technically. But um, in this sort of post-pandemic world, um, you know how humans and human capital is being managed in businesses. We're getting insights that, that, that we've never seen before with our with our platform. That's that's phenomenal, and that uh, brings us to the close, James. But it's amazing how uh, the product, uh, your market, and you professionally have kind of all evolved together to uncover so many things. So I just have one more um, bonus question for you. You know, given this this insane amount of data with respect to hiring and references and movements across organizations that you're able to collect, um, are there any interesting anecdotes or statistics that you've come across that would be useful for us, right? And also, given the space that um, uh, XREF is at uh, right now, What's your take for us as professionals, but also as humans, to in, to kind of invest in in referenceable relationships for ourselves? Good bonus questions. Um, uh, so, firstly, I think the the interesting statistics is um, uh, at the moment, uh, people, as I said before, pe- people are moving. You know, uh, workforces are becoming more mobile. Uh, so, employee mobility for uh, businesses is important. Um, we are we are seeing people move out of out of uh, major cities into into Zoom towns as they as they're called because people can work from anywhere even at XREF, you know we went from a office first uh, pre pandemic to now completely remote um, you know you know working environment and our offices in each of our in each of our uh, capital cities here around the world that we work in uh, are very much just employee hubs now. So people will come in and you know, work together as a team on maybe a certain day of a week or of a fortnight, but for the rest of their work from home. And people are expecting that. Um, it's, almost, uh, it's almost like a, um, uh, a, an expectation that you can, you, can, you can have that freedom to work where you want. I think the other part too is is that, Obviously, no different to to us. You know, we have seen uh, 
attempts to lure uh, m- much of our our staff to to jobs with with higher um, higher salaries and more perks and more benefits. And I think you know it's almost a given now that uh, work from home environments, um, you know, uh, benefits. If you're a publicly listed company or a company with, with sort of the ability to employ share plans, those sorts of things are almost like tickets to the game to, to, to keep somebody in a business. But what we're finding is, is um, and as I said, no different to us, uh, there are you know, a lot of offers of good salaries that are being put to people, but people are choosing to stay with, with their current employers and, and, and it's, it's, to, it's a lot to do with the purpose. So people might get offered... You know, stupid amounts of money to go and work for a company, but if they don't actually like what that company's doing, uh, if they don't sort of see the the benefit of that product that's being built, they they might not want to be part of that journey. And I think at XREF, um, you know, it's 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 very much about people being part of a journey. Um, you know, whilst we're a, a a referencing product, and and certainly the exit survey platform that's coming is is important. Um, you know we're, we're we're an important piece of a of a of a HR um, a process. However, you know we speak a lot about you know what we actually do. You know we we do protect businesses from hiring people that shouldn't be in in those jobs, uh, and quite often they can be in places of trust like aged care and and, and dealing with children. Um, you know, we're not we're not um, we're not heroes by any means, but certainly if we can be ensuring that people are moving into jobs that um, uh, that are appropriate uh, and and can do the job, then we've done a good thing. And and we talk a lot about that internally about you know, yes, we're a SaaS product, but we do good things, and people people like that. They like to see the journey we're on. You know, we we are about improving employee experience. So for us. Uh, that's what we talk to our team about. And I know businesses, there's a lot of great businesses out there that do the same. They spend a lot of time ensuring that their their employees are, have got a common common purpose and they understand the, the reason that the business exists. And what that's doing is that is that is actually helping people retain um, talent. And at the moment when there's a war for talent, um, you know, it's certainly... Uh, as I said, there's their money can only go so far. So, so effectively, you know, we are we are seeing that um, you know, you've, you you certainly got to have all the benefits and perks of, of other businesses. But you, the second part is is to attract talent uh, and to retain talent. You've got to you've got to really ensure that the, they understand what the purpose of the business is and how they fit into to that. You know. Everybody in our business contributes to not only the the product that we build and the the results to a we deliver to our client, but also how they impact our our profitability, um, and so that people are under no illusions as to uh, how important they are to to the business. And I think by doing that, you know, it's allowing businesses to 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 keep talent that they fight so hard to get to begin with. Uh, it costs a lot of money to bring on a new staff member. Uh, you don't want to be turning that over too too quickly. Um, the, the second part of the question. Um, I suppose you know I spend a lot of time you know um, just being aware of what's going on. Um, you know I use Google alerts to tell me what's going on in particular industries and particular areas. Um, you know, so I let technology you know, tell me what I should be reading today or what I should be what I should be keeping up on. Um, I think being very aware of of what's happening in, in our surroundings is important, but also um, knowing our limitations. So. You know, I lecture at university in a guest lecturing role, and I talk about the next stage of of the of the profession. I talk about the studies that I've done, and and I like to learn. But I'm like, well, to improve myself, you know, um, I'm I'm getting up to speed now on on marketing, more marketing things. Yeah, you know, what's the latest things there? Cryptocurrency, you know, that that's the next big thing that's gonna impact um, the way that we work, not just as accountants, but but also in business in general. Um, and, and development, you know, um, the best way I can know how much is required for, for our developers, you know, how, why we need so many people, so many testers and, and BAs and front ends and back ends and full stack developers is understand what it takes to build a product. So, so I'm always trying to learn, um, you know, learn things in the areas that I need to be spending time in. 
And that just means that, you know, I'm up to date uh, on what's going on. So I think that's sort of the, I think that answers your last question, your last part, last part of your bonus question. It absolutely does. Um, it definitely does. And this has been a phenomenal conversation, James, um, from accounting to being a practitioner to playing CFO. No, that's a hard enough journey in itself, but you've done all those three at the same time. So to close this, once again, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your story with our audience. And uh, most important, I'd like to have one of whatever you've been drinking because that is one hell of a productivity hack. <laughs> that, thanks, Vikram. I think uh, nothing I'm drinking. Fear of, maybe it's a fear of failure. You know, you'd, I never like to let never like to let anybody down. So I guess uh, probably don't say no as much as I should. But I uh, look, you know, uh, I love what I do. So you know, and I let technology, I let technology make my life easier. Uh, not in my, not just in my working life, but in my personal life. So, if you can bottle that and drink it, then, um, then you know, maybe we're on to a winner. Yep. Figure out what you love doing and just do it. That's it. Yep. Can't, can't agree more. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your time, James. This, this was great. 